Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by rockauto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. And thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 238. And joining me today are our writer and two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson. Our over-the-edge reporter, Greg Carlos. Hello. And our online content coordinator, Jessica Ray. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining me, and thank all of you for joining us. We've got a lot to cover. We've got three vehicles we're going to talk about, actually maybe four. A lightning round, a viewer question, see if anybody has got a rant or rave, and uh, so let's get right to it. Okay. We just saw within the last 24 hours of when we are recording this podcast, the uh, one of what I think most anticipated reveals in a long time. Uh, it's a prototype, supposedly. It's called the Nissan Z Proto, and I think you can gather what that's all about. It's the first new um, look at what might be the next Z car, I think since 2008. Is that right, Brian Robinson? The the, uh, the current one's been around that long. Uh, it sounds about right. And uh, so, what do you think? It was. Uh, I was actually uh, pretty impressed. It's pretty slick looking, even though they claim it's not production. It sure looked pretty close to it. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's start. Don't everybody start at the same time. <laughs> That's the problem with doing these video ones. There's a delay, and I'm looking at Robinson, and he's looking at me. Anyway, um, yeah, it's uh, like you said. It's it looks pretty production ready. I mean, there are some prototype elements to it that you know won't make it to production mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of like get everybody really excited about it. But I don't really think they need to do that because we're all excited about a new Z car and we've been waiting for one, it seems like for well, at least five years. Well, it's a long time. Long yeah. Time. Um, so they, they uh, as you'd expect, they kind of harken back to the 240 with the headlights, the original 240 from 1970. Um, and then I think on the back end, they go for the 300 ZX, which came out later, obviously. Uh, so they kind of incorporate a little bit from everything with all the different Z cars over the years. Um, again, it's a prototype, but they do actually have a powertrain for this thing, mm -hmm. which is um, a twin turbo V6, which I think we can all speculate is what we've seen in the Infiniti Q50s and the, uh, the Red Sport 400. So probably around 400 horsepower. Um, it's a very powerful engine, and most importantly, uh, six-speed manual transmission and yeah. probably an automatic option. Just when we think we weren't going to see any more afford halfway affordable sports cars, here it comes. Brian? Yeah, I'm not sure it'll be halfway affordable. <laughs> uh, we'll wait and see on that. Um, I don't want to go all negative, but since Griff's not here this week, I feel like I have to. <laughs> Fill in uh, for him. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's hard for me to get that excited about it because it's like the Jeep we talked about uh, last week. They're just, they just—they didn't give hardly any details as far as powertrain and stuff. So it's hard for me to get too excited about it. And I don't know. I always thought maybe the Z was a little over hype. Never really lived up to the hype for me anyway. I mean, they were fun to drive, but I'm not sure they ever lived up to all the hype. Um, maybe not a pure sports car, more uh, like a two plus two sport coupe. Yeah, and you know. The interior looks nice. I'll be that's definitely what it needed the most. Yeah. Was a place you want to actually spend some time in. Um, but we'll see. I'll have better uh, info once we, uh, you know, get a little more info. Jessica, you weren't in this business when the last one came out. And uh, I'm not sure you've had a lot of experience with the current generation car. So, well, as, actually, as an enthusiast, though, but what, what did you think when you first saw it? Well, um, my dad actually owned a 350Z, so it was always a, a treat when I That's was learning to drive yeah. uh, to be able to, you know, get behind the wheel of it. So I've always enjoyed it. I definitely, I think we're kind of right on it. Maybe it's not like the, the epitome of a sports car. Um, I certainly don't think my dad is a, a sports car kind of guy. So that's yeah. sort of why he... The, the Z sort of appealed to him. Um, Why? But more, a little more luxurious or, I mean. It was, it, it was, I mean, he was a, he's a Nissan guy. So mm. for him, it was like he had Altimas for, for many, many years. And this is, uh, I don't want to say like a step up, but well, this it is. is, 
yeah. the sport yeah. version Step of off. it. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's the sport version, and he had a convertible, so it was sort nice. of all of the all of it together um, for a relatively uh, a good price uh, for for that amount of of power and, and sport. Um, but it was, I mean, it was always fun to drive. I liked the size. I always thought it was a good size. And you know what? If they put the, uh, the Infinity, uh, that twin turbo, something similar to that, uh, it will be, I think, very fun to, uh, <laughs> to tool around in. I put what a vote for the uh, GTR twin turbo myself. Yeah. But. What did everybody think of the look? I mean, obviously, it looks a lot like the original as far as profile, but what got me was how ultra clean it was. I mean, it was, it's really clean. No, not a lot of stuff sticking out all over the place to grab your attention. That's certainly a departure for Nissan because they're, yeah. they love to have stuff sticking out to grab attention. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't really think of it that way, John, but you are right because you know, the, the profile line is super clean and I yeah. love the way the profile looks. Uh, it's got those big rear shoulders, but they're not like, you know, there's not all the angle. You don't have some sort of weird floating roof design that Nissan tries to throw into everything. I did think it was weird coming around to the three quarter front. You start seeing that rectangle grill and it yeah. looks okay from that perspective. And then you get to the front and you realize just how rectangular it is. I mean, it's just like a box essentially. And, and, and was, with the way they did the louvers, which they were making a big deal about in the press, it, it all disappears. Mm -hmm. so it looks like just, well, not I, maybe in person it will look different, but in the pictures it's just sort of like a big black hole. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's uh, you know it's a breath of fresh air. We uh, we talk around the office a lot about you know we have so few new sporty cars coming, and you know it's all SUVs, and so here's something from a manufacturer who uh, has a legacy, and uh, I think we're all very excited to see it. So. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll have a lot more on the Z Proto and what follows it next. Any idea what do you think it'll be called? 400 Z? I mean, if it comes out with 400 horsepower, that would yeah. be my guess. Yeah. I, I'd uh, put a vote in for Fair Lady. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, that would be. I wonder. I guess that's what they'll call it in Japan. Uh, I wonder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 2021 Ford Tremor off-road package, uh, you know, for the Ranger. Uh, you know, Ranger's gotten a lot of criticism as being underpowered and really, you know, yesterday's news because there's a new Ranger coming. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody really expected Ford to step up and do uh, an off-road package for the current Ranger. Is it a real off-road package? What is it, folks? And what do you think about it? And does it just lay the groundwork for something later? Yeah, I think everyone did expect it. There's been spy shots for a while. I think right. people thought it was going to be more Raptor uh, and a bigger transformation. Not that it's not. I mean, it's pretty significant. It's more than just a trim package. You got some lift, uh, 31s under there, general grabbers, which are always cool looking. And uh, it's a pretty tough truck to begin with, so I'm sure it can handle some abuse. In regards to anybody that says it's underpowered hasn't really driven one because I, I don't I don't think it's underpowered uh, by any means. Would I like to see a V6? Sure, but uh, that that EcoBoost is I wouldn't say it's underpowered by any means. I agree with that. I think it's one a, tr a surprising truck to drive. Greg, agreed. Yeah. So the ground clearance, um, I think it's nine point seven inches, which is um, just under an inch over a standard one. But you know, I mean, it's something. It helps. They do have the Fox uh, monotube dampers. So it, it's not like they're just throwing on some plastic cladding and maybe some hooks here and there. I mean, they are making it a, you know, you're gonna be able to do some serious off-roading. It's got a rear locker, um, you know, and it's for just under like five grand, I think. Yeah, so, not bad price. Yeah, and I mean, from a look standpoint, at least the one we saw pictures of, it was white with those uh, multicolored graphics. Kind of looked a little toyish to me, but um, I don't think that should take away from its capability because, like Brian said, it's not underpowered. I, I never understood why people thought that. It's a little loud. I mean, it's a I think loud. everybody just wants it. You know, it's the V6 mentality. If it doesn't have a V in it, it's, it's not up to snuff. Yeah. Jessica, I see you uh, shaking your head. Sorry. 
Oh, no. I mean, well, I see, I see what everybody says online anytime we post something. So, uh, do that. Uh, is that basically what they, the online posts say? Yeah. I mean, I think everybody has their preference. So, yeah, some people want, want a, a V6. Just to have a V6. Brian. I was just going to say those graphics are optional, which is, uh, to me, a good thing. They had some other pictures of uh, uh, darker colors, like there's a dark red without the graphics. That looks pretty tough. Yeah. Um, unlike are... the original Raptor, which came with those like fake mud splash graphics. You remember that? And they weren't yeah. optional. You had to get that. So at least <laughs> this one's optional. Yeah, and there's a bunch of uh, optional stuff too. Like a, I think a winch. You can, can you get a, a fact, yeah. not a factory winch, but a dealer add-on? Accessory. Um, yeah, just all kinds of stuff. If you like, if you really want to go over the top, I mean, you, you can, they'll do it for you. You know, and that just because a truck, it's got a V6 doesn't mean it's that powerful. I mean, I've got a, an old Ranger with their large, it was the largest engine they had at the time, a four liter V6. And it is, it doesn't hold a candle to the, uh, the current Ranger with a four cylinder turbo. So. Now I agree with that one. My Jeep mm -hmm. is a three point, I think, eight liter v6 and uh switching between the new uh four cylinders it's uh yeah no it's yeah we, we, all, all like we have v6 we have v6 boat anchors yeah and the uh just one final note uh it still tows like 7500 pounds so yeah you haven't lost any uh capability with the lift or anything like that you know really i think what they're i, I think it's they're kind of laying all the groundwork for the new Ranger and what they're going to do with it. And of course, that's what the new Bronco is, is based on. And I think the last thing in Ford's mentality is to bring out anything that isn't up to snuff or doesn't, ex doesn't basically live up to its billing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very curious about the new, uh, what they're going to call the Maverick. Their, uh, compact uh, pickup truck and even though it's car based i'm thinking how could they possibly bring out something that essentially is a replacement for the original ranger that doesn't beat that truck you know so uh, i think ford's ford's all about trucks so i think they got a lot of new stuff coming too and i think the new ranger will probably be pretty impressive when it gets here Okay, uh, on another scale, and uh, totally different and uh, an incredibly impressive vehicle, uh, 2021 Lexus LC500 convertible. You know, we love the coupe. It's a mixture of uh, futuristic and retro. Here's the convertible, which uh, when we first saw it as a prototype, we said, you know, it's, it's a winner in looks. Now that we've all experienced it, what do you think? Yeah. Beautiful machinery. Um, I think what V8. gets you, what's that? V8. That's what I was going to hit on next is um, when you look at something so, it looks so high end and luxurious and like a grand tourer, and then you get into the throttle and it's super raspy. I mean, it's it sounds like a good naturally aspirated V8. Really nasty. I mean, yeah, it's, you don't expect Almost it. nasty anyway. It's a, it's a good thing for sure. Um, yeah, it's, well, the coupe when it came out, I mean, you just knew it had to be a convertible. This thing, it's just so good looking. It's comfortable inside. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the interior, you know, it looks kind of nice, but functionality is not quite on par with Germans. Um, but still uh, just a beautiful car. And, you know, you got, it is a Lexus. So I think you can feel pretty safe about the powertrain and just its dependability. Yeah, this car, it was weird to me. I don't know if it's because I spent more time with it than I did with the coupe, but I wasn't that impressed with the coupe as far as the performance of it. But this, it seemed, the convertible somehow seemed even sportier uh, to me. It seemed uh, super flat in the corners and that, I guess you hear the engine more because you got the top down. Right. It adds a whole nother level to it. Uh, but I don't know if it's, I know they did adjust the suspension to, to handle the weight of all the convertible uh, knickknacks, but it just seemed to me to be so much more enjoyable to drive than the coupe. Uh, I don't know if that was just me or if anybody else noticed that as well. I kind of thought so too. I think maybe I wasn't sure if I remembered it uh, well. Jessica? I unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to, to get Shame behind on the you. wheel of it. I know. 
oh, well, things being so complicated right now. Well, <laughs> Everybody really doesn't know, but the vehicles come in to our uh, studios. We all live different uh, distances away. So some of the vehicles come without everybody having a chance to get in them, which is typical when things are normal. So having said that. But, but yeah, I mean, no. super yeah. luxurious, uh, for sure. Um, just the leather quality, everything uh, lives up to uh, what you expect in a Lexus. And it's interesting to me that they did bring it out with the V8. You'd think maybe they'd uh, put the hybrid in there as well, which they may at some point. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll take the V8. And the, um, the top operation, which, you know, it's not the only one to operate while driving. I think on, like under 30 miles an hour, maybe a little bit less. That's a nice little feature because you don't realize like if it's about to rain and you just want to like pull off to the side and maybe keep rolling a little bit or if you're coming to a stop sign or like a safe intersection to be able to put the top up while you're still moving and not have to wait, you know, the 20 seconds or whatever it is. It's, it's a nice feature. It's the coolest thing in the world when you're strolling through the parking lot and you're raising your top <laughs> as you're parking, as you're pulling through a spot, even better. Yeah. Could you... Uh, could you find the top operation switch like right away or did it take you a second? Was that it took a second. Yeah. yeah. But it's actually slick the way they have yep. it kind of hidden. Yeah. Yep. You know, I haven't taken count, but the number of V8 powered automobiles is really small now. And to still be able to get a powerful V8, and I know I'm old school, a lot of people probably don't. I don't know, Jessica, do you even care whether it's a V or four cylinder under hood anymore? I think I care about gas mileage. Good. Yeah, well, okay. Can you, so. you do care, but it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, it was, um, it's kind of, you know, I looked at it and said, well, there's not going to, you know, personal coupes, what we used to call these, the two-door coupes, they're kind of almost gone away. This one's, uh, and if some of the Germans are about the only ones left. And it's, here's one with a V8, so. Yeah, it's definitely more of a European thing. I yeah. wouldn't say they, the, you know, Lexus that beat them at it, but they're, it's, you know, it's every bit as good. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to our lightning round. Actually, no, I got one more vehicle I want to talk about. I said there was a fourth one, and this uh, just happened. Uh, Hyundai's done a globe. I'm seeing like Hyundai does a global reveal or Kia about twice a week right now. <laughs> But they've, uh, they have shown their fourth generation, I believe it is, Hyundai Tucson, their compact SUV. Um, what we could tell from what information they allowed, which wasn't a lot, they're going to do uh, two wheelbases, a long and a short, uh, kind of like VW does. And we're going to get the long wheelbase, excuse me, much more upscale looking vehicle inside and out. Uh, I know we don't know too much about it, but any impressions? It had that real chiseled uh, look to it, like the Toyota CHR, um, which I thought it looked good. Um, but as far as like every segment, Hyundai has like a super competitive vehicle. I, I think the Tucson, to me anyway, would be the one area they were lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, they came out with that Kona, which is smaller, and that, that vehicle is fantastic. So it uh, looks like well-needed vehicle. It looks like they did a good job with it. Yeah, I mean, styling-wise, I think it looks – it looks very good, looks very sleek. I reserve my judgment until I can like see it in person because there's a lot of edges there. There's a lot, it's a lot going on. Um, but I mean, it's interesting because you'll be able to get it in internal combustion, hybrid or plug-in hybrid as well. So I think um, that's, that's great to have, you know, to be able to have all three options. There's the fuel economy thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they got, um, they're going, and I think we're seeing this actually increasingly. It's like now that everybody's getting big screens, they're actually segmenting theirs. They got two, two of them stacked, uh, which I thought was a little different and, um, and not some, I mean, something we've seen before. I think actually the stack screen, probably Honda would did it before anybody else even thought about it. Uh, so they're, they've made the interior look, I think, very upscale and uh, a bit different. Um, nice second truck. A little bit different face. I thought it was going to be more Gladiator, and it is sort of, but it's it's uh, not Gladiator. Sorry, Palisade. But I thought I think it's more stylized. It's almost like like they're they're moving beyond Palisade pretty quickly. 
So. Yeah, I'm, just to throw my hat in the ring and say I contributed. Um, if it's anything like the Sonata we drove interior wise, oh, yeah. I was blown away by the Sonata's interior quality. I mean, it's beautiful, works well. I mean, everything is just, I mean, that I don't get into a car often and feel like I'm blown away, but I, I really was by the Sonata. I agree. Nice car. Okay, we have a viewer question from, um, actually, we have a lightning round. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. And we were just talking about Ford and their pickups. Ford has applied for a trademark for the word warthog, which many believe will be used on an extreme off-road focused Bronco for going the Raptor moniker. What do you think? Would you buy a warthog, folks? I don't know if warthog is the name you want to go with. I mean, <laughs> if, if anybody like myself played uh, Halo on Xbox when it came out, there was a uh, – uh, an all pretty much an all-purpose vehicle called the Warthog. It was cool. Uh, can't say I really love the name, though. I mean, I, I guess I get it. They want to kind of make it differentiate a little bit, or like not just put Raptor on everything. You know, just keep it to the trucks or the pickup trucks. Uh, I just don't feel like Warthog is a very attractive word to say. I think it's pretty cool. It'll depend. You know, hopefully they'll have some kind of cool little uh, graphic, but. It'll <laughs> <laughs> a little hood ornament now. Yeah, it all depends on the uh, marketing. I mean, Dodge, you know, who wants to buy a Demon? But, you know, the, uh, they've taken uh, all the Hellcat, Demon, all those things and uh, ran with those. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to the Warthog. Yeah, I mean, not, not surprising that they want to sort of keep Bronco its own separate entity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the trim levels j just themselves uh, are, you know, very – unique toward the Bronco. So I, uh, I'm not surprised. Warthog, I guess I got to see what they do with it, how it looks, um, if it can sort of feel like its name. <laughs> well, you know, I'm the show, you know, I'm pretty behind the times when it comes to online gaming and Greg mentioned, and, uh, you know, the fact that that was the name of a vehicle in a video game. And of course, Jessica, you're the, our, our online strategist. Do you think that, had any part in it are they playing to that audience the not the you know not the old bronco audience like me but this the new crowd what do you think any is that possible i guess it's a possibility um i could I, see some young engineers suggesting it yeah, yeah. I, I think we have to remember that you know it's people in their 30s and 40s who are now making major decisions and they all played halo like i did so i'd be shocked if they didn't, uh, you know, look to video games like Halo for inspiration. Mm. Certainly won't look like it, but, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. It's not. It. I, think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's lot, cool. I did a lot of damage with that warthog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a viewer question from Ed. Would your staff have a recommendation for the best handling minivan? I'm looking for the cargo capacity and spaciousness of a minivan, but with excellent handling capabilities. All I know, yours. I don't know if excellent handling capabilities is a word you could use for any minivan, but there are a lot of good ones out there. And I'm a huge minivan, minivangelist. Min, min, there's something there. Right, I, I got out. it. Um, Most but, useful yeah. vehicle on the planet. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, you can't go wrong with an Odyssey. They just, they offer so much and it's just such a dependable vehicle. But I think, you know, I kind of like the Pacifica maybe just as much. I think it handles great as a plug-in hybrid version. So, I mean, you even have a lower center of gravity there with the battery there below the floor. So, I mean, if you want to really get into handling characteristics, <laughs> it lowers the center of gravity a bit. Yeah. I feel like this is a made-up question, but... It's not. I can... right. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get excellent handling no matter what minivan you buy, but uh, I'll agree with Greg that the Odyssey, is, to me anyway, is by far your best option as far as handling. But all of them have such aggressive... I don't know how aggressively he plans on driving, but all of them have safety systems that are hyper-aggressive due to all you know, the high roof lines and all the heavy weight up top. So... Uh, you're not going to be able to get away with much as far as uh, corner carving, but uh, I would start with the Odyssey and drive that one first. Jessica, any input? 
I don't really have much experience in the minivan segment good, quite good yet. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a couple years away from that. So. <laughs> haters. You guys are all haters. Hey, they look very good, and there's quite a few new ones uh, coming out that we will be testing within the next couple years. The, the Sedona, uh, yeah. There's, right. there's a Sedona. I'm excited for the Sedona. I think it uh, hopefully it lives up to sort of the the production stills we've seen so far because I think oh. it might be the best looking one. Yeah, if I, I just popped in my head. If he wants to go used, you remember the uh, Mazda 5? I do. It's like a true a sliding door mini, minivan. Yeah, it was actually small in size versus uh, what that's we true. call minivans now. That thing handled fantastic. I love you know, that. that that's a real good recollection. I mean, I bet you could get one pretty inexpensively too. Smaller, but it's still big for its size. If it's yeah, I mean, my dad rented one years ago, and he was like, he couldn't believe it. He was yeah. raving about this car. The only other thing is that since you've got um, Sienna and now the Pacifica with. Uh, all-wheel drive you've got two of them at least have some traction in the rear and that might give you some advantage we haven't uh, tested the uh, the Pacific all-wheel drive yet uh, so if you are looking and say you go back and forth at least give uh, Ed give the uh, all-wheel drive versions uh, a little bit of a, a try but I agree with Robinson you know as soon as you start doing anything sporty the uh, the traction control and stability control just puts you in your place real quick. So if, if we get enough people asking this question and some of the manufacturers want to help us out, I'll be the one to volunteer to drive them around Summit Point or Dominion. Uh, great. I got no problem there. If Kia, if Kia put sliding doors on that Soul, you would really love that one. Oh, my God. That's it. That's the only car I'd ever own. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, anybody got a rant or rave this week? I, I mean, we've talked almost uh, ad nauseum about how bad drivers are during this. Oh, Jessica, all I yours. do. All right. So this is something that um, bothers me to no end because it's lazy and uh, very dangerous. But nothing bothers me more than when you're in a bit of traffic and you're coming up to a green light and um, there's so much traffic ahead of the light that if you went forward past the white line to go through the light, you get stuck in the intersection, stopped. Mm. And the amount of people who do that, that I see all the time, it blows my mind because I was driving somewhere the other day. We have a lot of trains, uh, the light rail where mm. I live. So um, they're always coming through and it really backs up traffic. And I was about to go through a green light, but if I went through, I would have stuck out totally in the intersection. And the woman behind me in a huge SUV honks at me to go. When you can tell that the, the traffic is all backed up because there's a train and everyone stopped. Um, and I, I, I recently moved, but on my previous commute, when I used to actually go to work, there was a, a light where it was, um, you would go straight, but then there was, um, the, the light was there because, so people could merge onto the road. Mm -hmm. So what people would do was, there was another light ahead of it, and there, people would just get so backed up for like maybe uh, three quarters of a mile. Mm. And what would happen was, People would just completely use up the whole intersection because the other the light ahead was, was not moving. So there was absolutely nowhere for anybody to merge onto the road when the other light turned green. So it just created more and more traffic and it's, and it's extremely dangerous. So I think more people, I, I just don't feel like people teach that. Like you really they're, should stop they're blocking the intersection, but they want to get the advantage and they don't, and they're stuck there and you can't move if you're coming into the intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with that. I, um, I live uh, near a four lane non-interstate highway and there's a couple of, you have to do um, go right to turn left. And when you do that, you get stuck at a light 
And when the traffic is heavy on the main road, people pull forward and block that intersection. And they do it constantly. Most people just, they look at the vehicle in front of them and do whatever they do. They're not paying attention to intersections, whatever. Or lights or so, signs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if the guy in front of them going, they're going to go. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is. I, I you know, I, I, I'm not saying that the Europeans drive better, but they do have a better system of drivers training. It's not just getting in the car and driving around a little bit. They actually teach you some manners and car control. And I, and I don't think it'll ever happen here, but I wish it would. So. Yeah. The, I mean, as I've, I've recent, not recently have been the most recent person to, I guess, go through driver's ed. Um, <laughs> on the motor week crew um but it's not super extensive and no. uh you just sit in a classroom and nobody really nobody really is listening truthfully so i don't know well, I I've, think I've, part I've, of it that's recently done i mean every state's differently yeah as far as that goes my kids recently gone through it and it was fairly extensive actually i thought as far as driving he had to do you know at least 60 hours on yeah on the road before he get his license and he had to go through six hours with an instructor. So, and that time I thought they did a good job of not just teaching them. When I took driver's ed, it was very similar to what Jessica said. Here's what you need. Yeah, to pass me test. too. This guy was very good as far as, look, you need this to pass your test. No one does this really. You, this is how you really need to operate a vehicle in real world. So I thought he did a, a good job with that. But here in Maryland now, because of the COVID restrictions, They've done away with all uh, on-road tests. Now you basically just go into the parking lot, park, and then pull out, and then they're like, here you go. <laughs> Good enough. Make sure they can do it while they're on their phone so just, you know, oh, yeah. we can replicate a real-world situation. I don't know if we've gone backwards or forwards. I remember many years ago, and I won't mention the state, but there was a, a, a reporter uh, who um, basically went in to get – his or her driver's license renewal and they went in with dark glasses and a red tip cane and they got their license renewed so you know it, it wasn't a maryland situation but it just shows you how uh, uh screwed up this system is you can't discriminate so, man you can't discriminate <laughs> yeah that's right i'm pretty sure you still have to you still have to go through the uh the thing where you look through oh for our eye, eye yeah. yeah yeah those letters it's been the same 12 letters since i was 16 so have you got it having, memorized having re yeah i mean having <laughs> renewed my license every four years from now it i do have them memorized yeah so, i don't, I don't I think should anybody be should be i don't be i don't think anybody should be shocked that the dmv or the mva as we call it in maryland are lazy mm. they just like get out just get out of my face so i can sit here and not do anything Ooh. Oh, well, we're going to hear some, we're going to get down. some comments about down. that one. Down, it's Greg. <laughs> Bring it on. I don't care. I, Pro I, hey, I, prove, prove me wrong. I think we better wrap this up before we get in any more trouble. All right. <laughs> thanks, everybody. And that was Greg, folks. Brian, Jessica, thanks very much for uh, taking part in our podcast today. I want to thank Jim Bigwood, our audio engineer, who makes sure we uh, sound uh, terrific. Podcast uh, producer, that's Greg again. And our podcast creator, Bob Mixter, back at MPT. I'm John Davis. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Now, if you've got a screen or you've got audio, you can find MotorWeek, MotorWeek.org. We've got our podcast. Jessica works tirelessly making sure all of the social media platforms are filled. We have millions of you that watch us on YouTube, not to mention your public TV stations around the country, and of course our partners over on the Motor Trend Cable Channel. So if you've got a way of consuming media, we're there and we hope you'll give us a try if you haven't already. For all of you that are uh, viewing and listening, as I say every week, we'll see you soon and thanks for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by rockauto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.